What's up, everybody? Isaac here with Civil Engineering Academy. Excited to be with you on another podcast episode. Appreciate you liking and subscribing this stuff, sharing it with a friend. It all helps with the Google machine and uh, helping us spread the word of Civil Engineering Academy. Today, I bring a great guest on, Eric Bitsko. He is with Firmatech, which is a drone company, and he helped to start a drone division that specializes in utility in the utility world. And so I wanted to bring him on and talk about his experience in flying drones, how he found himself in the role of a senior vice president doing this work and how you as a civil engineer or a civil engineering firm can really use these drones as a tool in your tool belt to help you get further ahead, whether that's collecting data or improving processes. It's all there for you with this awesome tool. And drones keep getting better and better and better between the software and the hardware. Uh, There's some neat stuff going on. So Eric talks about his own journey into this world and finding himself flying drones for a living. And it's something that you could do too if that's something you have an interest in, even as a civil engineer. So without further ado, let's get to my conversation with Eric talking all things drones coming up right after this. All right, we're rocking and rolling, Eric. Thanks for joining me on the Civil Engineering Academy podcast. Appreciate you doing this with me. Yeah, appreciate you having me. I'm excited. Um, I always love to start these out just talking about your own background. So how did you find yourself, I guess just describe your background and how you found yourself doing drone stuff for for 100 percent accidental just stumbled on to to be completely honest um so back when i worked at uh burnhouse electric uh i had a buddy that i was working with and he bought a phantom 2 drone when they first came out and uh he called me up one day and he's like hey man i got a cool new toy i need to show you like come on i assumed it was like a gun or something you know something like that and uh he shows up at the house with the, uh, you know, this big old ox. I'm like, man, what is that? You know, and he pulls this drone out and I've never seen a drone. I've heard of drones from my military experience, you know, a little bit different use cases, but uh, a little bit, uh, but yeah, he took it up in the air and we're sitting around the, the backyard, just kind of drinking, cussing and discussing and, you know, Hey man, how can we use this? What kind of, you know, what kind of applications do these things have? Right. It's a flying camera. So we immediately started diving into like, hey, we can do inspections, we can do this, we can do that, you know, and just kind of bouncing ideas off of each other. And, and uh, a few months later, we had, uh, it was, it's, I guess, 2015, um, we had Memorial Day floods in, in Central Texas. 500-year uh, floodplains is really where that got hit. And uh, so we had lines down across the rivers and everything. So we, one of our bright ideas was let's tie a string to this and fly it across the river. And so we cleared it through upper management. They said, yeah, no, go send it. So um, we tied jet line onto it, flew it across the river, tied rope onto the jet line, and then tied wire on the rope and, and got the lines back up. And it, it worked really, really well. Um, you know, kind of some of the traditional methodologies were more along the lines of, uh, you know, an apprentice in a kayak or, uh, you know, tie your favorite crescent wrench onto a string and throw it across or the old bow and arrow, right? Um None of which kind of implied a, a, a level of safety that was really, uh, you wanted to shine a light on, right? So we did it once. It worked really well. So we ended up doing it six or seven more times throughout that that event. And uh, it worked really well. Got lines back on, you know, while the flood, the flood waters were still up. And some places, the, the water was 50, 60 feet outside of the banks in elevation. So, And just so yeah. people know, at this time, you're a line, you're lineman. You're out yeah. Yeah, like poles, so, string and wire. Yeah, yeah. So I was a I was a journeyman lineman. I'd been at uh, I left construction and went to more of the tech services side of the house, caps, rakes, reblowers, skating control devices, and and um, I'd been there for maybe a couple years at that point. So still kind of green behind the ears. Um, uh, as far as as far as the the technical aspect went, and so I had a lot of experience doing like you know sticks and ground wire on sticks. But uh, that kind of set off a, a whole different career path that I didn't even know was was on the horizon for me. So we took that technology and, you know, obviously the store related stuff worked out really well. Um, but, you know, we spent the next kind of year or two kind of really kind of building different use cases around how do we use this in day to day? And and what 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 benefits can we glean from it? What insights can we, you know, kind of gather using this new technology and what can we do to improve our workflow? So it kind of. So there was, was there a position that opened up that led you to this tech side of things at work or you found something you made? It- no, that, like I said, I, I accidentally stumbled upon it to be completely honest, man. And, and, um, you know, it was kind of, 
it, it fit with the technical kind of aspect. So our initial use case is obviously stored. Um, and then we started using it to inspect just our special equipment, right? So mm. all the all the stuff we didn't wrap up, we didn't let the regular lineman mess with it, right? Um, and then that kind of kind of expanded out and expanded out and expanded out until you know, next thing you know, we're we're we've got full time dedicated pilots. We're training lively to kind of dual use for more of that quick reaction for us, that QRF for like outages and troubleshooting, and and then next thing you know, we're we're inspecting the the entire system as a whole. So. Um, it just kind of just kept compounding and growing and, and it, uh, it got fun quick. Well, I'm fun. So what are you doing now? Where are you at now? So now I'm with Fermatech. Um, I'm standing up the electric utility vertical, been here with a couple of years, um, started from scratch again. So, um, I have a lot of my knowledge from, from the utility world that, that definitely is translating, but, um, different opportunity, much better opportunity. I think from, from my personal standpoint. Um, I get to take the program that I built at her analysis and kind of take it abroad, right? Um, I get to I get to work with, you know, from a small co-op in Alaska that's only got, you know, 500 meters to some larger IOUs uh, across the U.S. So it kind of runs the gamut and just kind of spreading the spreading the, the knowledge. And, and it's mostly an education campaign, right? Here's here's a tool. Here's how we use the tool. And then here's to the insights and data that we can glean from that that. So just so maybe our audience knows, how is the utility world using drones? You, you with Fermatech, how are they using drones in the utility world? Um, yeah, so, and maybe spark some ideas on how maybe this could be used in, in the civil world for really any industry. Yeah, so it, from from a utility standpoint, you know, it's we're taking pictures of distributed assets, right? So conditional assessment. Um, planning, construction units. There's a lot of stuff that kind of touches operations and engineering from the utility side of the house. Um, you know, storm response is another one that was kind of an initial use case for us. So um, there, the technology is starting to kind of integrate into a lot of existing workflows and improving those workflows. When you start looking outside of, of the utility space on, on more of the, the simple side of the house, you have different opportunities for uh, you know, project tracking, some thin models, um, you know, doing ortho mosaics and, and photogrammetry that kind of really give you good insights into into different different engineering projects that you could be doing. So, you know, building digital twins and helping those into different different modeling softwares to kind of digitally break what you build before you build it. So you can kind of engineer around it and and kind of plan for for different weak points or maybe you engineer weak points in so, you know, the cross arm breaks instead of uh, you know, the whole full coming down. So different stuff like that, you can kind of really glean. That's more utility stuff again, popping all over the place, apologize, but <laughs> it's all again. I go back to what I know. So <laughs> <laughs> I like it. So, um, you know, there's a lot of utilities. Uh, I work for utility. A lot of them are saying that they ban Chinese parts and this and that. And so you're kind of limited to the scope of what drones you can use. So you're you're working for Fermatech. Is there any limit to what drones you guys use? Uh, is it an open book? Do you train on everything? Do you know everything? How's that work? Yeah, we've got a little bit of everything. You know, um, we've got you know over 400 drones in our fleet, and that covers everything from you know like a fixed wing, uh, fixed wing like hand throw uh, drone, all the way to the vertical takeoff fixed wings um, to quadcopters, and you know big, small. Um, there's 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 different use cases for each platform, obviously. And, you know, we have a, we have a toolbox that we can select from for, you know, best tool for the job. Um, we, we do see it pretty often that, you know, the, the non DJI or the, the non Chinese, uh, you know, uh, approaches and, and, and rightfully so I understand why, um, I can make an argument both ways, you know, um, really depends on where's that acceptable level of risk and, and kind of what, um, what's palatable from, from a risk standpoint. So, um, you know, yeah, uh, the most the most work that we do from the utility side of the house is going to be quad the the quadcopters. Uh, we get into the hex and and octocopters uh, for more of the heavy lift. You know, when we're when we're getting the big lidar sensors up there to get real dense point clouds, um, which allows us to see cool stuff on the backside. As far as post-processing. are you using it to pull a line in, or are you using it at other use cases I've seen where they're knocking ice off of conductor and stuff? Are you guys doing that too? Yeah, I mean we've we've done some we've done some line pulling. Um, it's definitely in the minority as far as use cases go. Um, it's just not as prevalent, right? Um, and I think a lot of that comes back to 
that education campaign. You know, we come and we talk to utilities all across, you know, North America, South America, um, overseas as well. And, you know, it's a really useful tool. There's also some very, very niche use cases. I've seen, um, I've seen a use case. We haven't done it, but a, a buddy of mine uh, used a drone to change a light bulb on top of a, a towel. You know, so instead of you know putting putting someone in a harness and having to climb to the top of a you know a thirteen hundred foot tower, put a drone and uh, a light bulb on there, and you twist it on, and then twist it on. Really? Yeah, it's uh, some interesting use cases, but. You know, at the end of the day, it's a tool. It's much safer to put a drone up there than than a human. Obviously, a lot of times it's a little bit cheaper too, just because you know when you start getting to the more more risky jobs, um, those those folks get paid a premium to do that. So, yeah. if we can avoid some of those hazardous man hours and and put a tool up there or a drone up there as opposed to a human, um, that safety aspect it's it's hard to put a price on. That. So, do you guys experiment a lot with different attachments or come up with different stuff? Because not. You know, to put a light bulb up there, you don't just go buy a something out yeah. there that does this. Yeah, there, there's not a light bulb attachment that comes standard. So we we do have some folks on our RRD team that you know have 3D printers, and we experiment with different sensors and you know payloads that you know potentially could be beneficial. Um, in one of our other business verticals, we're doing a lot of methane detection. So um, that's been kind of uh, the pointy tip of the spear where our where our R and D team is using most of the most of their resources right now is, is kind of get on, get on the schedule and, and kind of developing kind of TTPs, technic, uh, techniques, tactics, and procedures. Um, as far as like using different sensors, a lot of this stuff is, you know, we're borrowing from other, you know, kind of ground-based sensors and Hey, can we attach this to a drone and how do we do it? You know, God. with the methane stuff, you know, taking wind readings and, you know, tracking plumes from, you know, landfills and stuff like that. So, we're doing we're doing a lot of work uh, uh, with like the EPA on some of that and standardizing. You know, again, this is all really new technology that has you know pretty much you know the sky's the limit. Sorry for the pun, but um, <laughs> that's terrible. Well, there there is a limit, <laughs> right? <laughs> you can only fly so high. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, it's it's a super useful tool, but it's not a golden bullet, right? Um, yeah. There there's definitely some applications where manned aircraft or, or, or man, you know, or even ground inspections just make more sense. But could you briefly describe, cause a lot of civil engineers out there, you know, they're preparing for these exams that they're trying to become a professional engineer, but as another tool in their tool belt, they can go and get this license, this part 107 license. Could you just briefly touch on what that takes to become a licensed pilot? Yeah. So the short version is you can you can go and you can pay to take uh, you know a, a training course to kind of walk you through and really explain kind of ins and outs. Um, we're we're borrowing a lot of that that information from from the manned aviation world. So you know reading your reading your sectional maps, understanding airspace, um, you know understanding weather and how that affects you know the the platforms that you're flying, center of gravity, stuff like that. Um, to be completely honest with you, when I would train like linemen to fly, right? Another tool in your toolbox, kind of similar, I think, use case there. I had a two hour long YouTube video where there's some gentleman that goes through and he he does a great job explaining it in, you know, caveman terms for for folks like me to really understand. Um, and really kind of translate it to, you know, the try to translate the pilot speak into in the again, caveman terms. So um that's what that's what uh that's what you know, YouTube's a, a great place to kind of, you know, allocate resources and, and, and really kind of distill down the information in, in, in really understandable terms. Um, as far as the testing goes, um, you go to an FAA certified testing location. I think it's a 50 or 60 question test. It's been a while. Um, I think I took my initial test in 2016 when it first oh, came in or that. Yeah. It's, it's been a while. I've slept since then. So, um, but before that, I had a Section 333 exemption, which kind of pre predates the Part 107. So well, uh, they definitely made the process a lot easier. Uh, the barrier to entry isn't near as high as it used to be. Um, so, yeah, you take a you take a, a 50, 60 question test. It's a it's a knowledge based test. Uh, I managed to pass it, so it, it's not that difficult. I took uh, it as well. So yeah. they get <clears throat> they gave us two hours to take the exam. I took it with a guy that was uh, a lineman. He was in and out of there in 20 minutes. And I was like, oh, yeah, he 
just had to use the bathroom or something. But no, he was done he with the exam. Back. And I, I went and checked on the front desk. Hey, did that guy pass that exam? Yeah, he passed it. And I was like, holy cow. <laughs> that guy is just a testing wizard, man. I wish yeah. I could, uh, <laughs> some people are just, just good at testing. But I, I, If I think about it too long, I'm going to screw it up. I'm over. They did. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, Eric, what's your current title? And what's like a good day and a bad day for you? Current title is a senior vice president of electric utilities at Permatech. So someone someone screwed up and made me a VP of something. So uh, <laughs> no, a, a good day for me is when I get out of the office and I get the, get my hands on the sticks. Man, I, I do enjoy flying. It's it's fun. It's challenging. Um, you know, we. We've got, you know, dedicated full-time pilots, so I don't get, I don't get that opportunity to fly very often. So when I do get the opportunity to get out on the field and, and, and get some stick time, I always enjoy it because there's a, there's a finesse, uh, manual flight, right? And we're inspecting these lines. That's all me, right? There's some automation that's starting to come on board, which is, I think going to make, make our job easier to scale a lot, rap- a lot more rapidly. But, um, for the most part, you know, there's, there's a, there's a definite skill that, that that's required and, and the finesse of, you know, flying the drone and being precise and that precision involved with, you know, making sure that you're not wasting air time. You know, we're, we're kind of limited with, with the battery technology right now. Mm-hmm. There's some other cool stuff that's, that's, that's out that I think will, will aid in that flight time. But for right now, you know, we're limited on, on flight time. And so, how to best utilize that flight time and, and, and be as efficient as possible in the air is, is, is definitely, you know, is a skill set. So, so that's a good day. Unless you got to get practice, right? It's just like, yeah. yeah. And people, you know, if you don't use it, you lose it a little bit. Oh, you got to get out there. I, I can definitely tell when I got on the sticks in, in a, in a, in a couple months, and man, that, that was those first couple of poles are rough. <laughs> uh, they sloppy, man, borderline embarrassing, but, uh, <laughs> But it comes back, man. It's like riding a bike. You, you knock the cobwebs off those skills, bring it, you know, get those neural pathways just kind of re-energized and, and off we go. Yeah. What's a bad day? What's a bad day? Have you had a bad day, a bad project, something didn't go right? I would say a bad day is, um, we don't like to call them crashes. We call them unscheduled landings. Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> Yeah, bad days when you take a thirty thousand dollar drone and it and it comes out of the sky, wrap it a lot, a lot faster than you planned on. Um, that's a pretty bad day, man. That that's a dump truck full of boo boo lips when you have to explain uh, how you've just crashed a thirty thousand dollar drone and I promise it wasn't my fault. Most of the time, it was you know um, pilot air. Those things are those things are pretty rock solid. So um, that's a bad day. Okay, that's that's a definite bad day. That's a definite bad day. Well, uh, you kind of touched on new technologies. Do do you either as a company or as a, as a person, maybe you you like just researching stuff, but how do you stay ahead of the curve on new stuff that's always coming out? Yeah, just just keeping the ear to the ground. A lot of this stuff is is conversational, right? Like you you talking to to end users, right? We we do a lot of work for utilities all over the U.S. and listening to them and like what are some pain points and. What are, what are some of those edge use cases, right? Like light bulbs on top of the tower, you know, Hey, can you do this? Um, I was talking with a utility a couple of weeks ago and they wanted to do a pull. They wanted to know what height holes they had. Mm-hmm. So, you know, just kind of cussing and discussing kind of different options and understanding kind of what, what data we currently have available to us and how we can use that and potentially kind of take that to the next level and, and maybe find a use case. Right. Um, for that example, you know, Hey, we really want to know pole heights. Can you do that with a drone and just kind of sit there and letting that hamster wheel kind of start smoking? Um, you know, we, we kind of figured out that, Hey, in the exit data on the backside of the drone, we have, you know, GPS cord, GPS coordinates that were, that were able to pull from there. We have projection angles. So we could start pulling some of that data out. And then, you know, we just change our shot count and next thing you know, a little bit of math, a little bagging theorem and, now you can mm-hmm. start ascertaining full height or, and then that spins off into, Hey, joint use clearances and, you know, height above ground and height from lowest electrical connection. So, um, stuff like that, talking to the clients and, and, and really kind of understanding kind of what use cases and what data they really want to see, um, kind of definitely keeps you on the, on the, on the, the pointy tip of that spear. Hmm. That's interesting. So, um, you know, my audience is probably mostly civil engineers, but, if there was a career path 
for someone that wanted to get into drones or even into a role similar to yours or something like that? Do you see that as a career path and maybe what, what are some of the options that are out there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, you know, if you have industry experience, you're going to understand the pain points, right? You're going to understand kind of what data can be collected and how that data can improve existing workflows, right? That's how you accidentally become a vice president. Um, <laughs> but, you know, also for folks that are that are just getting into it, you know, getting experience, getting to, I tell people all the time, the best way to learn how to fly the drone is get on Amazon, buy one of those little $60, I think it's like a Sima XCX or something like that. They're 60 bucks. They come with little, you know, Apple batteries that, you know, you need tweezers to plug them in and you only get probably about five to seven minutes of flight time, but it's, it's, it's manual. It, it, there's no GPS. There's no nothing. You're learning how to fly that air and it's going to come out of the sky a lot faster than you plan on the first couple of times. You're going to get it hung in a tree and the wind definitely blows those drones around a lot. But once you kind of get enough experience on that, you build that confidence up to where, okay, now I can go fly a $30,000 drone and not necessarily be sweat bullets, right? Because mm-hmm. um, you have the confidence you can fly. Them. So, you know, I think that if you're already in an industry, especially on the civil side of the house, you understand kind of what the needs are and you can do, you know, a quick, quick Google search and you can start finding a lot of cool, cool data that comes out of it, like digital twins, right? That's something that, you know, that definitely, you know, you can take into an environment and and make your job easy. You know, if you have that information to start making better educated decisions, at the end of the day, that's that's what that's what these that's what these tools do. Yeah. They can give you more information to make better educated decisions based on data and not just, you know, feelings. Well, I know I use them. Um, it sounds like it's a growing industry too. Um, I know you're with Firmatech, but there's probably others also. It just seems like as as a whole, this is a growing kind of sector that's out there. Yeah. I think from, you know, looking at like the technology adoption curve, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with that, but you can Google it. Um, I think, you know, we're, we're, we're starting to make that transition out of the early adopters into kind of that early majority. And I think, you know, I think the, the technology is kind of proven itself. The rules and regulations are starting to catch up. Um, and I, and I think the industry's here to stay. And I think, you know, we're, we're just at the very tip of that iceberg. You know, I think there's, there's a lot of technology that I think is on the horizon where you're going to start seeing, you know, multiple technologies kind of start merging together and, and really, really providing some robust assets that I think are going to be really insightful. And, and I love getting nerdy on some of that data. <laughs> I eat it up and love it. That's awesome. He plays dumb, but he's not. Mr. Yeah. Harry. <laughs> oh, Harry. Well, awesome. Well, this has been a fun conversation, just talking about drones, drone usage, and how people can become pilots, and really all the use cases that you can have out there to get gather data, make make your life easier, or processes to be improved. So, uh, and Eric, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you if they had questions or wanted to learn about Firmatech or just ask questions to you? Yeah, LinkedIn is probably going to be the best way to to reach out. Um, shoot me a message and. We can take it offline or we can, you know, stay in the, in the messages on, on LinkedIn, whatever's, whatever's easiest. Um, but yeah, shoot me a message and, and I, I can talk about this all day long or I'll, I'll wear out a recording. So he's traveling <laughs> the nation talking about drones. Yeah. 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 <laughs> awesome. Okay. Well, we'll go ahead and link that in our show notes and point people to you that way. I uh, appreciate you jumping on and talking about drones with us. Yeah. Appreciate you having me. It was a blast. So, all right. See ya.